Um, thanks for uh, joining us today for our webinar on AI. Uh, this is a topic, we actually did one of these not quite a year ago, I think it was last May last year, uh, Scott Fish from uh, 32 Degrees Digital did a uh, AI presentation to talk about AI kind of from one angle. Uh, this was uh, one of the most uh, burning topics at UVMC in New Orleans. Uh, during the roundtables, there were dragging chairs in left and right into the circle to talk about AI, how to use it, what you're doing, things like that. And uh, we continue to get requests and inquiries from people about uh, what, how do we use AI or what some of the tips or the tricks or what's going on with AI in the meetings and events industry. So we decided to do one again here uh, as a follow up to a, a webinar that Chuck did earlier this year. Um, so we're going to get into it today. But before we start, I just want to share a couple of statistics with you. Uh, so in terms of thinking about how broadly AI has been adopted, 80% of salespeople report that they are using generative AI to create basic content like sales pitches and emails, while 70% are using AI to analyze market data in some fashion. Uh, now, keep in mind that this was a Salesforce survey. So you're talking about some very large industries. Uh, retail, uh, manufacturing, you know, other places like that. Um, and so obviously in a lot of those settings, they've got huge budgets, large powerful tools and, and different things at their disposal to drive that. But it's definitely something that in the last three to five years uh, has, has picked up big time within our industry uh, for people that are in positions of doing sales and marketing and outreach. Uh, but the second statistic in that exact same report is the one that I think is also really important for those of us on the call today who may not be using it yet. That might be why you're here today is you're thinking, I'd like to use it, but I don't really know where to get started or how best to use it or what it's going you know, to do is 73% of sales professionals, even though most of them are using it anyways, they're worried about the security risks with generative AI and 49% don't know how to use it safely at work. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Uh, and we're gonna talk about kind of the difference between um, you know, what you can do at very low risk versus what you do at high risk. But generally, this is a, something that everybody's adopting, everybody's working with it. And if you're not working with it, you're probably uh, losing pace or losing ground to some of your competitors out there that have adopted some of the AI tools or strategies that we're gonna talk about today. So let's go ahead and look at the agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk just briefly about the emerging trends in the use of AI for sales and marketing. Uh, we'll talk about using AI to support outreach and lead generation for your business. Uh, we'll definitely look at some examples. I've got a ton of examples of how to use AI to create efficiencies in your life. Uh, so how to shortcut the process of doing research or writing emails or generating content that you need to get out in front of planners and other individuals. We will then jump a little bit into the challenges and the ethical concerns that uh, people have and that we might have with using AI uh, and how to sidestep some of those or avoid them completely. And then I'll just open it up to questions. So I do have a lot of slides. I'm gonna move pretty quickly today, especially over the examples. My intent was not to let you read every line on the responses that came back from the chat bot, uh, but to just give you a sense as to what kind of content you get. We will make the presentation available to you afterwards. So if you do wanna read every line in the response to a chat prompt, you'll get the opportunity to do that. The other thing I wanna do just a level set for today is there are a bazillion tools out there that you can get uh, in your hands to help with different aspects of artificial intelligence. Uh, many of them have monthly or yearly charges. Um, for today's exercise, I used the free version of ChatGPT. So everything that you see here today is going to be something that you could do on your own if you wanted to at no cost to you or your venue. All right. So let's jump into it. Let's look at some emerging trends. So the first trend in the use of AI is hyper-personalization. And what hyper-personalization means is that people are using AI to do tons and tons of research on individual buying preferences and habits so that they can speak directly to the customer in their sales and marketing and outreach. And so they're looking at your buying habits on Amazon. And that's why you get suggested to you, since you bought this product, you might like this product out here or why you uh, might uh, be surfing something on the internet and then you're served Facebook uh, ads for similar products for the next one week to six months of your life, depending on how uh, aggressive that, uh, that company is with their retargeting. Uh, but the idea is that by using big data and by using uh, artificial intelligence, these companies can drill down into every single individual person's identity 
and what it is that they're looking for and what their value proposition is based on their past history, their browsing experience, their purchases, the different things that they do. Uh, so that's one thing that AI is definitely uh, leveraging within the sales and, and marketing industry. Uh, another trend is that uh, a lot of people are using AI-driven predictive analytics for sales forecasting. Uh, so, you know, the old days, you'd sit down with your, your budget for the following year and say, well, what do I think we're going to sell in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four? You know, maybe you break that out monthly, depending on the kind of business you are. Maybe you're doing that daily. Uh, if you're a restaurant or a retail uh, store or something like that. Um, and that was a lot of using gut and instinct and, you know, some review of past performance. Uh, but there's absolutely no comparison to a computer crunching all that data and spitting it out and saying, you know what, we've looked at the last 20 years and on this day of the year, and it'll look at it not only as a date, but also the day of the week and say, here's what we think your sales are going to be based on past history and any economic indicators that you've put into the query that tell us uh, what we think might happen in this particular year. So like as inflation is going up, sales might be going down, it'll balance that out with historical data that says, here's how we've performed in the past. Again, something that there's there's big data tools out there that help you to do that. And a lot of people are driving that forecasting part through artificial intelligence. Uh, another trend is chatbots and virtual assistants to enhance customer engagement. And we've probably all seen this ourselves in our own shopping experience. You surf to the web page, and if you're lucky, it waits a minute or two before the chat bot pops up and says, do you have a question? Or, hi, I'm Joel, your virtual assistant. Or, hey, you know, what can we help you with today? Uh, sometimes that thing pops up two seconds after you get on the web page, and I just close those immediately because I'm like, give me a little time to see what I'm doing here. But uh, at the end of the day, those can be programmed to ask and respond to questions in ways that drill down into are you actually a good customer or not? Are you someone that is a high end, a high uh, uh, engaged client? Or are you someone that maybe just kind of browsing around and doesn't have a whole lot of interest? Uh, and they use that then to decide what additional engagement they want to send your way uh, based on how hot they think you are as a prospect out there. Um, it also enables people to get good information quickly without surfing through the website themselves. Uh, so some people use the chat bots also on their, their uh, shopping experience to shortcut doing their own research and figuring what, what's uh, out there. And again, we'll talk a little bit later about what some of the pros and cons of that might be ethically. Um, AI generated content and copywriting, that's probably why a lot of you are here today is just to say, what can I do with AI to make my life easier? How can I get a computer, uh, AI, to write a blog post or a social media post or an email message or a series of emails or whatever it might be to shortcut me having to do all that work from scratch every time we launch a new sales campaign uh, or every time I'm going out to, to develop something new? Uh, can I get someone to help me out with that first? And I'm definitely going to show you some examples of different ways in which you can use uh, AI to do that. Uh, and then finally is predictive lead scoring qualification, kind of going back to that same chat bot, um, you know, experience where they've kind of programmed in asking you a different series of questions to drill down as to how hot of a prospect you are. The same thing can happen from just monitoring your website browsing patterns uh, or taking a look at the kinds of questions or inquiries that you send in um, and be able to say, okay, uh, this lead we should definitely spend some time with because their past history tells us that they might buy, uh, whereas this one, they've never bought anything in this price range. Let's just send them a nice quick message and move on, dedicate our resources somewhere else. Um, so let me stop there and see if there's been any questions that have come in, Corey, that uh, in this first part of it yet. No questions yet. All right, perfect. Now I will keep rolling along. So... AI can be really useful for doing work in the outreach and lead generation space, which is something that we all are tasked with doing. Again, I know most of you, if you're, uh, if you're even if you're like some of us at uh, Unique Venue, sales is not our full-time job. We have other things operationally that we have to do or educationally, like I'm doing today, uh, that we have to do. Um, but, uh, but this is an important task that we have. And AI can be a big help in terms of bringing down the amount of time that you spend on some of these tasks. Um, one of the first ways that AI can do that is through data scraping and website monitoring. 
Um, so let's say, for example, you're like, I want to find out about, I, I need I need to add to my CRM. I need to put a whole bunch of new meeting planners in from the Midwest. Um, how can I go ahead and find planners in the Midwest? Uh, and there are tools out there. We actually use one called Seamless AI. Um, it is something that we pay for on a monthly basis at Unique Venues to uh, scrape websites and data and sources of data to be able to come up with individuals that match the query specifications that we put in that might be likely prospects as meeting planners in the Midwest. Um, and then uh, the benefit of seamless AI is that that data is also uh, verified to a, a certain extent of reliability. Uh, and so it's not like pulling from a website from 20 years ago, or it's, you know, done some work to say that, yes, this email fits the actual pattern for what an email at this business would typically look like that sort of thing so that the information you're getting in is more reliable than if you're just trying to do all that self work yourself but it can come up with a list of a thousand planner names in seconds as opposed to you taking four weeks to do that same work uh, to come up with the, that list of a thousand names so that's one way that a ai can really help to do that uh, the second thing ai can help with is market research uh, you know, AI is predicated on the fact that it has access to and has already indexed billions and billions and probably trillions of pages worth of data across the internet. And it can tap into that in just a few seconds and come back and answer simple questions or fairly complex questions, depending on how you set up the prompts. Um, and so if you're wanting to know uh, what are the hot trends or what are the things that are going on or who's buying in these areas or what are pe people really looking for or when is the best time of day to reach out to people, like you can use AI to ask those questions and find out what it is that, uh, you know, the, what it is that you might be able to do to modify your business practices in alignment with the latest research that's available out there. Um, the next thing is customer feedback consolidation. Uh, so let's say you get a lot of reviews on your website, uh, but you want to take the time to read through all of that. AI is a great way to just say, summarize the top five uh, uh, criticisms of my venue, and it will scour your 12,000 reviews, and it will come back and spit out, well, here's the five most common themes that people have referenced in there, or here's the five things that people like the most, or whatever it might be. Uh, and so it's a great way to do that for yourself, for your competitors, or for whole industries, right? So uh, I, I want to know what people think about having meetings at stadiums and arenas, and you can ask it to scour customer feedback that's publicly available out there to come up with information that tells you, oh, here's an angle that I can do because people don't like this, but we do it better than maybe everybody else out there, okay? Uh, the next one is intelligent segmentation. Uh, this is where it takes your lists of, um, of individuals that you're doing outreach to, and it actually, again, does a lot of analytics around their buying patterns, their sales history, their website searches, and things like that. And it breaks them up into groupings by certain factors that you set up. So tell me who is a high budget meeting planner as opposed to those that are medium budget and those are low budget. Instead of just getting a list of those thousand planners and saying, okay, I'm going to send out to all of them, you're like, no, 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 I'm only going to send out to the people that typically spend $15,000 or more on an event, right? So that's where intelligent segmentation comes in. And, and there's all sorts of variables that you can use in that process to break groups of individuals up to target the ones that you want or to target custom messaging towards all of those individuals out there. And then finally, again, one of the reasons I think a lot of people are here, uh, lead generation assets. Uh, so, you know, for, for doing outreach, oftentimes you're starting an email campaign and you just sit down and start writing that thing from scratch. Um, you can use AI to get a jump start on that. Uh, if you're in charge of managing your Facebook page, and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to post twice a week. I just can't think of another thing to write. Let AI come up with a starting point for you or come up with a post that you can tweak and put out there and, and meet that schedule for when you have to put those things out. So there's a lot of different ways that AI will support your outreach and lead generation activities once you get used to doing it. Now on the previous slide, I had forgot to mention that there was an asterisk on some of them. Uh, all the ones with the asterisk definitely require access to big data. 
If you don't have a huge CRM, if you don't have a whole POS system that analyzes history, if you don't have access to your uh, raw form of Google data, those things are probably not things you're going to want to get into because you need the big data for them to be effective. But um, the other ones without that are definitely things that you can utilize without access to that. On this one, the asterisk may require paid tools, as I mentioned, like with uh, seamless AI, or may require access to big data, like again, the intelligent segmentation too. So it's not things to ignore, but again, if, if you're saying I got to book 20 more pieces of business this year, you don't need to be worrying about intelligent segmentation. If you're saying I got to book 2,500 more pieces of business this year, then that might be worth investigating a segmentation tool where you could use AI matched against your CRM to drill that down into the highest prospect uh, you know, leads or into different segments of types of business, uh, holiday social, uh, large youth gallery, whatever it might be that you want to do to do targeted outreach specifically to the individual individuals that are in your CRM. So again, let me stop there before I get into a couple examples and see, are there any questions? And I can see there's a lot of exchange going in chat, which I love. Yeah, no questions, but um, Laura Hamilton and uh, Karen are asking about, you know, we've talked about ChatGPT. I mentioned Gemini, which is Google's um, AI tool. And I'm also going to be mentioning Grammarly as another um, AI tool, are, are there, this is for Jewel or anyone who wants to participate in the chat. Are there any other AI tools that you rely on? Um, and if so, feel free to just kind of make a reference of that for anyone else who's interested. And you'll see a couple more later in my tool slide that I've got, um, you know, web browsers at this point all got their own that are starting to be built into it. Um, you know, there, there are tons of options out there. They're all basically doing the same thing. At the end of the day, ChatGPT um, and Grammarly all have access to the same internet space. They may be parsing it a little bit differently, and they may have a different range of historical use of the prompts that have been entered into them to help categorize and index the data and the responses that, that you're giving back. So you likely would get a slightly different response between ChatGPT and Grammarly, but it's probably not going to be hugely different. So you just need to settle on the one that feels right to you and that you're most comfortable and the user interface is, is most notable and things like that. So, well, we do have a question. Yes. Um, do you have to be specific on what you are asking an AI bot? Like um, it says like say intelligent segmentation or is it just how you word the question? So, so intelligent segmentation again would be something where you are using probably a purchase tool that probably costs you a few hundred dollars a month uh, to be able to input a wide variety of uh, demographic factors about the people that you're trying to sell to and matching that against a robust CRM of individuals that also have some characteristics. And then hopefully matching that also against a POS or a sales history system to say, here you go. But what you're gonna see in a little bit when I get into some of the examples is that for, for content creation and things like that, there definitely is a need to make sure that you're clear and precise with what you're asking, because sometimes you can get the wrong thing. Now, that's not a bad thing, because what's great about these chat tools is that you can just say, OK, wait, uh, modify this request. And instead of doing this, I want you to actually do this. And I'm going to show you a couple of things where I just ask very generic questions and some where I've been really specific about what I want it to spit out. So we'll take a look at those here and, and we'll look at a couple of things in relation to outreach and lead generation first. So. From a data scraping perspective, uh, I simply went to ChatGPT and I said, provide me with a list of meeting planners in Northern California. That sounds like something we'd all like to do, right? If we want to track planners from Northern Cal. Uh, so I said, let's put that in and see what uh, ChatGPT says to me. And what ChatGPT said to me is, oops, I can't provide real-time data or lists, but I can suggest some ways to find meeting planners in Northern California. And then it runs through actually what I would call the unique venues playbook. Um, which is, you know, you can go to online directories like unique venues. Uh, you can go to event planning associations or local business directories. And everything. So the point of this one is, is that there are certain limitations to what you can get out of the free services um, because they're, they're not designed to actually do true data scraping for you. That is why we use Seamless AI uh, because that one has a 
<clears throat> there's there's a back end engine that's running behind that um, that is also got all the legal stuff that's backing it up to say we got this data legally. And uh, if we give it to you, you're paying for the fact that it's protected, authenticated, and legal for you now to purchase it, purchase it from us. So uh, just a quick example of one of the things you can't get necessarily, data scraping is probably a, you're going to have to find something that you pay for for a little bit out there. But it, 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 at least it's nice enough to come back with some suggestions about where you can actually go look for some of that data yourself. Uh, what about market research? Another one that we talked about here in outreach strategies. Uh, here is the prompt. Describe the key factors that influence meeting planner purchasing decisions for venue locations in the hospitality industry. Now, that's a pretty broad question, but I was like, let's just see what, what ChatGPT thinks meeting planners are looking for when they're looking for venue locations. So what did I get back? Uh, I got back uh, location, capacity and layout, facilities and amenities, ambiance and atmosphere, cost and value. I mean, these are all things that probably make sense to us and things that we would intuitively know. Uh, but it's nice to know that ChatGP can run out there and scour millions of articles and surveys and other things that have been published and come back with, here's the top things that planners are looking for. Um, so that as you're putting together information for planners on your website, or if you're putting together a sales email outreach or whatever, you can address some of these things because you know that they're important to planners um, as a part of the materials that you're putting together. Okay. Uh, and again, it went on with more here. And again, you'll get the PowerPoints. So if you want to read through all of these later, you can certainly do that. Uh, I just want to make sure we get through everything today. Um, customer feedback. I talked a little bit about that. So here's a general prompt for customer feedback. Summarize the top three critiques in customer reviews for banquet hall rentals. So what do people not like when they've rented banquet halls? Now, again, in a general thing, it's probably reviewing billions of reviews. And this came back to me in about four seconds. And the answer was uh, poor communication and coordination, inadequate facilities and amenities, and overpricing and hidden fees. Those were the three things that people disliked most when they rented a banquet hall. So if you're a banquet hall, what can you do in your outreach? Well, you can tell people why these things are not what they're going to experience at your banquet hall, right? Uh, you can hype up the, the level of service and communication and how much attention to detail you pay. You can let them know uh, how good your facilities are and how they address some of the things that other banquet halls come, fall short on. And you can talk about your fees and things like that more transparently than saying, oh, gotcha, uh, on the day they show up to use the facility. So again, this is one way to get that. Now, again, the point I want to make is that it came back to me in four seconds. That's not because it scanned uh, billions of customer review records in four seconds. It has do already done that probably a million times. It has cataloged and indexed that data and when I ask it, if I'm asking it the way it's already in there, that's great. And if I'm not, then it thinks a little bit and merges and looks at other data and compiles it. And then it stores the response to that prompt as yet another piece of cataloged and indexed data that it has access to. Um, so keep in mind that you know it, it's not that it is just running out and getting the most current information. It may have information that dates back a year, two years, five years, because uh, it's it's collected as much information as it can. And, and again, you'll see later why that is one of the things that we do have to pay attention to when we're doing this. Now, if I want to dig in a little bit more deeper, specific feedback, summarize the top three critiques and customer reviews for the Tucson Convention Center Music Hall, uh, which I could have guessed what these were because I've been to three or four performances there and I know exactly what they are. Uh, they're poor acoustics, they're bad maintenance, and... Uh, organization and management, uh, you don't try calling the ticket office there. Uh, it's, a, it's a mess to, to be able to do that. So, um, but, but here's validation if that, and I'm doing that because I know that the Tucson Convention Center wasn't going to be on this call today and I'm good friends with the manager over there. Um, but, uh, but this is definitely something you can do if you want to find out what people are saying about you uh, or your competitors. So what are people saying that they don't like about your competitors out there? Or on the flip side, I said, modify this request then to provide the top three benefits and customer views at the Tucson Convention Center. And it came back with saying location, uh, ambiance, and variety of events, right? So you can do it from both sides if you want to do some customer feedback development 
um, and see what people are saying about you or your competitors or a specific industry or component of the industry. All right. Any questions on that section of it? Not seeing any? All right, we'll keep rolling along. Here are some AI tools worth investigating then. And I'm not going to go through what each of them does, uh, but I've kind of grouped them here. Uh, so we've got a research and content management grouping. Uh, so there's Jasper and Seamless and Flick and Phrase and Browse and Grammarly could have been put in there and uh, Gemini and, and those are those are all ones where you can ask questions and they will come back to you with answers based on the prompts that you put in. Um, now, the ones that you pay for, even with ChatGPT, the free version is the older 3.5. The 4.0 version, you actually have to create an account for. You don't have to pay for it, but you do have to create an account for it, which means it starts to store your individual history. So if you're one of those people that doesn't want people to do that, then you don't want to go that route. But, um, but many of those tools, when you pay for them, you have a much deeper level of ways you could set up the prompts. So ChatGPT is literally just put it in one box and spit out an answer. But these other ones, you can put in multiple components. You can upload files or spreadsheets or different you know, uh, information. Uh, you can definitely segment and, and provide some different criteria within it. So you can get some really deep research that's done once you comfortably learn how to do the tools. And all these tools, there are you know, plenty of help guides with them or plenty of YouTubes of people showing you, yeah, here's how you ask a good question in Jasper AI to get the answer that you're looking for. But those are research and content. Uh, for image and visuals, uh, these are all different ones that will help create AI generated photos or videos. Uh, so again, if you want to shortcut the process and do a, a, a 30 second video on the planning process at your venue, but you don't wanna be the face and record it, you can go out to a couple of these and it will actually, you just put in the information or the script and it will record the video for you using uh, a public domain or, or a licensable um, open source uh, graphics or images or things like that. And the next thing you know, you have a 30 second video to put up on your website out there. Um, and then management and sales, the, the three there are ones that can help you with kind of managing the sales process, uh, doing different aspects of setting up campaigns, managing campaigns, uh, doing outreach to customers and things like that. So, you know, one of those days when you've got free time, I know who of us has free time, but if you do find yourself with some free time and you're saying, maybe I should check a couple of these things out, here's a good list for you to be able to go out there and be able to do that. Okay. Jewel, I have a question from uh, Francisco from Pirate Ventures. Yes. Francisco says, I know ChatGPT has around a one to two year knowledge cutoff date. Specifically, when asking about current trends, is it still good to trust and go off of what it suggests? So it's a great question, uh, which is why I didn't use ChatGPT to get the current trends for today. I did my own Google search. Um, so I think that is a wonderful example of, as we'll get to it, um, you know, the dangers of using AI um, is that there is an information lag. Um, there is also an information bias that comes with it because it's going to take 15 years worth of data and it's going to try to blend that across time without having the context to really recognize how the world has changed in the relation to all of that data, um, which is why, again, what I'm doing today is a very simplified end of it to at least show you that there are ways that you can do things here to help yourself out. But it is not the be all end all. And the tools you pay for, many of them will have less of a time lag in them. Um, or you can actually set up some windows of which time range are you really looking for? Like, give me information from, you know, uh, 2000, 2021 to 2024. Um, uh, if I did that in chat GPT, it would tell me, yeah, I can't get data from the last couple of years. Um, but uh, some of these other ones will. Um, and then you just need to kind of look at what you're getting back and say, does it meet my expectations for generally what I thought was going to get back. And if it doesn't, that's where you need to go do that Google search and check it out for yourself and say, is this right? Or is this just because it's pulling data from an older period or it's not, it doesn't understand how time has shifted in the last two to three years? It's a great question. Uh, and one where, again, you'll see towards the end, um, it, this is not, you, you should never just put in a prompt, get an answer and shove it out there. 
Uh, there's more work to be done, but it can save you a ton of time at least getting started on that process. Okay, uh, moving on. Efficiencies, and this is what I know a lot of you are gonna be uh, excited about. Um, there are different ways that AI can help you be more efficient with your work. Uh, so the first area is sales enablement or onboarding. Uh, so this is where if you've got new customers coming in and they need information, uh, if you want to develop handbooks, if you want to develop checklists, if you want to develop uh, uh, worksheet forms, if you want to develop whatever it might be that helps onboard a customer, uh, you can put it in the prompt into AI and it will spit out a great starting point for you that then you can take and tweak. Um, again, the more sophisticated your prompt, the better that output is. But even just getting someone to give you a checklist of the 20 things that a planner needs to do before they show up at your venue, uh, you don't have to think there and come up with it. It'll spit it out and then you can tweak it from there. Um, as we've already shown a little bit, customer product and industry research is a big thing. So if you want to know more about uh, what are the hot products in a particular area or what are the hot trends in this area, uh, whatever it might be, keep in mind that data might be a little bit old, but it's still going to be pretty relevant to just give you a sense as to where else you might want to go look and see, okay, does this still align with the, the top 10 or 12 articles that come up on a Google search about the same kinds of technology trends or whatever it might be that exists out there. Social selling is huge. If you are using social media and you feel beat down by constantly having to create content for it, AI is your savior. It absolutely is. Now, again, you shouldn't just put it in, let it spit it out and post it to your Facebook page. That'd be bad practice. But um, if you need to say, hey, let's plan out a three month campaign, give me 16 posts around this topic and I want them to have this flavor, uh, it can spit it out. And then at least you've got 16 starting points for the next sequence of what you're doing to be able to tweak or add to or modify rather than sitting down from scratch and doing all that work for yourself. Uh, we'll see a, a, a couple of examples of that. And then call scripts and sales pitches. Uh, if you are someone who is not uh, the world's greatest writer, don't feel bad. There's lots of people out there that aren't great writers. Um, even those of us that might consider ourselves to be good writers, uh, AI can make your writing better. Uh, if you take what you've written and you give it and say, make this better, it, it will go through. And if nothing else, it'll do a nice grammar and clean up and whatever. But you could say, make this better and give it a, a light humor touch to it or make this better, but make sure it's very formal and professional oriented language or whatever it might be. AI can take those things and get them ready for you. Or you can just simply say, here's what I need. Uh, here's the message I need to send. Uh, can you write it for me? And then you take it and modify it from there. So. Let's look at a bunch of examples. So here's a social media post. Uh, write a Facebook post, aim at meeting planners about the benefits of holding a meeting or event in Washington, DC. So I put that in chat GPT and here's what came out. Attention meeting planners. And then it came, AI really likes to work in lists. lists. You'll see that lots and lots of prompts that you put out there comes back with item one, item two, item three. That's just the way that AI thinks. That's not exactly how humans think. It's not super far off either though, uh, but it is the way it likes to organize and present data. So you're gonna see a lot of lists in the examples today, uh, but this would be a great post if you just needed to say, okay, if I wanna put something on my Facebook about why you should come to Washington DC, this isn't bad. Like you could tweak it a little bit or you maybe add another point or take one of those out that you don't necessarily think you wanna emphasize, uh, but there you go. Uh, there's a social media post for you that took three seconds uh, for AI to write and, and send back to me out there. Then I said, modify this message to be specific about holding a meeting or event at the National Press Club, uh, who is a client of ours but wasn't registered to attend today. Um, and so I went ahead and did that. You'll see it, it has a little bit of a similar format, calling all meeting planners. Are you seeking a distinguished venue to elevate your next event? And then it digs into some things about National Press Club specifically, which it likely has taken from its website. Uh, so it, it knows what's on the website. It's able to pull things from their mission and values or their uh, what planner should know page or whatever it is, but it does all that work and it comes up with it in three seconds and spits it out for you. Uh, and so you can see the things that obviously it pulled off of the National Press Club's pages to come up with this social media post that someone could put out there Facebook, listserv, or uh, uh, LinkedIn, wherever it is that you're going to do it at, okay? 
So you can go more general, you can go more specific, depending on what you want to do. And again, you can really ask it to write about anything uh, that you want to have happen. Here's a blog post. So write a blog post that highlights the most important things to consider about presentation technology used in meeting events. So if you want to establish yourself as a subject matter expert by having a good blog post on your website or uh, you know, in your, uh, you know, in your catalog of resources that talks to planners about presentation technology, here's a great way to get a good start on it. So I put this in, hit the button, and here's what I got back, right? Uh, in today's fast-paced world, success of meetings events often hinges on effective presentation technology, and it starts to scroll through all this and talk about audience engagement, accessibility, ease of use, so on and so forth. There was more that was in there. I think on this one, I only captured the first part of it because I think it went on for probably seven or eight or nine different things. Um, again, great starting point for you to spit something out, makes you look like you really know what you're talking about, um, able to put it up pretty quickly. And again, after you tweak it to, to sound like you or look like or emphasize the things maybe that align with your venue uh, and the things that you offer there related to presentation technology. Website profile page. So if you're writing new copy for your website, which is everyone's least favorite thing to do, or one of the things on our end from a unique venues perspective, people are always like, yeah, I'll get around to filling out my profile page just when I get time to write content for it. Um, Chat GPT is a great way to get started on that. And so I just said, hey, write an about us paragraph for the Ranch Events Complex in Loveland, Colorado. Uh, they are a client. They do have a nice about us section on their profile. But uh, if they didn't, this would be a great way to get started out here. And so it just went out and it has already got their web page is out there information. And it wrote a really nice about us page, um, which mirrors their current about page pretty good because they've got a decent one. But if you didn't have one at all, uh, it would just come up with it. It could scour your web pages or it could scour your mission statement or whatever it is you give it or feed it. And it would say, okay, here's a good about us section. You tweak it a little bit, cut and paste it, stick it on your website or put it in your unique venues profile and move on to the next thing that you need to do. Okay. Sales email, write a short email to planners about the benefits of hosting a meeting or event at a stadium or arena. So if you're a stadium or arena client out here, you might, uh, again, be regularly kind of doing outreach and saying, hey, I want to tell you about all the great reasons that uh, you should come to, to my particular stadium or arena. Put this in. And what I got out was, hey, dear, here's the subject name, dear so-and-so, I hope it finds you well. Wanted to reach out and introduce you to an exciting opportunity for hosting your upcoming meeting or event at X Arena. Uh, and then here's all the reasons why they're a unique and dynamic atmosphere. And you can see impressive seating, versatility, cutting edge technology, on and on, team support. Whether you're looking to impress clients, motivate employees, or celebrate a milestone, hosting your event at X Arena promises to be a memorable and impactful experience. Love to discuss, blah, 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 right? Again, instead of sitting down and writing these from scratch, throw it into chat GPT, let it spit something out, tweak it to fit, or update it to add in more relevant information about your venue, your stadium or arena. And then you've got a nice email ready to go that took you uh, 10 minutes instead of an hour to go through, write it, edit it, have someone else look at it, do all those kinds of things in relation to it, okay? Here's a deeper prompt. So I said, you know, you can go very general with these things. So just write a short email about the benefits or you can go deeper. So here was one where I said, take these four bullet points and the core values of unique venues and write an email introducing unique venues to venue owners and operators. And you can see that I put four different bullets in there that I wanted to make sure are highlighted in this message. So instead of saying, just scour the unique venues website and come up with something, I have some very targeted things I wanna make sure I'm communicating in this outreach campaign. So I did that. And I got back, okay, dear venue owners, operators, hope it finds you well. It likes to use, I hope this email finds you well. You see that a lot from ChatGPT. Um, here's some key points of unique venues and how we can benefit your business, specialized marketplace, comprehensive support, transparent pricing, and a human-centric approach. Now, again, these were all predicated on the bullet points that I pulled together and what it pulled from our webpage and knows about our core values and things like that to be able to write this thing up. Again, I would never send this out exactly as written. 
but I could certainly tweak this into a message that I would feel comfortable saying, yep, this sounds like Joel. It reflects the points I'm trying to get across and I can get this out a heck of a lot quicker than if I sat down and tried to write this thing from scratch myself. Yeah, warm regard, that's another one too. It's like warm regards. Uh, it definitely, uh, that's why sometimes you have to tell it to be a little bit more formal in its writing. So it will actually use things like dear Joel and sincerely and otherwise it, it definitely tends to drift to the more informal side of writing uh, simply because that's, I think what most people have asked it to do in the past is do more informal. A lot of us write too formally and say, could you make this a little less informal? And so AI just has a, a habit of, of tending to do that. So, okay. Warm regards, there it is. Poof, see? All right. Uh, site visit. Uh, let's say you have to plan a site visit for a client and you want to put together a site visit agenda for a tour of conference and event spaces at the University of Maryland College Park. Again, I didn't do anything but stick this prompt into chat GPT and it uses its access to the wealth of information to come up with this. Sure, here's a sample agenda. So it says date, time, location, agenda, welcome and introduction, overview of conference and event spaces with a presentation and information and a Q&A, a guided tour of facilities, main conference event spaces. So it, again, it's pulled it from the website. Um, so there's some things that it would say should be on that tour, break and refreshments, opportunity to interact with university staff and ask questions, uh, go over additional services and resources, so catering and AV and parking. I mean, again, think about how good this is in terms of putting together what you would normally do anyways, but you've got a starting point to then tweak this instead of sit down and do it from scratch or dig up a former one if you can even find where you've saved it in your files and then use that as the starting point for what you're putting together. Some more discussion and customization, some closing remarks. And then here's my favorite in this, because as a higher, as someone that worked at higher ed for 25 years, I just love this, a optional campus tour. So as long as you're here, we saw the meeting spaces, but do you want to see residence halls or uh, the football stadium or anything like that? Because it knows that people like to see campuses. And so it even ChatGPT said, yeah, let's throw in an optional campus tour. I mean, it's a little scary sometimes when you think about what's really happening here. Like, I'm not one of those people that believes AI is going to replace us in the next 25 years. I, that's not going to happen. It's going to continue to get more sophisticated, but it's already really good at what it does as a starting point for the materials that you might want to put together. Okay, any questions on any of that stuff that I just went over there? No, but some kudos for that being awesome. All right, cool. Love it, love it. Again, you will get all this so you can read through it and you'll be able to save the prompts and you can go. Some of you might already be playing yourselves with ChatGPT, which is great. Uh, have fun and you can have a great time doing it. All right, let's talk a little bit about the challenges of using AI then. So one of the biggest is that public AI tools are not secure. So if you are using AI that is using the public domain, which most of them do, and you are uploading spreadsheets, you are uploading uh, your current handbook, you are uploading the email that you wrote that you wanna make better, it's going out into the public space and it's gonna be used for all future responses to a prompt that's similar to the one that you're asking right now. So if you have uploaded something that has private or sensitive or confidential information, you've made a big mistake because it's now out there and there's no way to get it back and it may appear in somebody's response to a prompt down the road that uh, Joel Hoff makes X dollars per year because I uploaded that by mistake in an email or a, a spreadsheet or whatever it is out there. And that would be bad for that kind of information to get out there. So you really have to think about what you're doing with the information you provide to it. Not a lot of danger in just doing what I've done here today with putting typing prompts into chat GPT but with other tools where you have a broader way of uploading information into them to get a much more uh, detailed and specific response to your prompt uh, and the filters that you might place on that prompt can be pretty dangerous if you're not thinking about it. And lots of major companies have huge policies about not using any of these tools and uploading any uh, company or proprietary information into them. As we've talked a little bit about you know, throughout this today, Outputs might contain inaccuracies or be out of date. So um, think about the fact that, again, not everything that you read on the internet is true. But AI is using everything it can find on the internet to generate responses. So if 
20 billion, you know, 20 million people insist that the sky is red, over time, AI might start telling you that the sky is red because it, 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 can, it cannot in and of itself gauge the accuracy of information. It is using a preponderance of what do I see on one side of an equation or another to say, here's what I think is the correct answer to your prompt. But it doesn't have the human capacity to evaluate that and know that that's nonsense, even if 20 million people have said that the sky is red. So, so you have to be conscious of that. And as we talked about earlier, there is a lag. Different tools have different windows, but there is a lag. So it's not like you press the button and it scours everything up to the minute. It's catalog data up to a year to two years ago. Um, you know, some tools may be as recent as six months, but not a whole lot much earlier than that. Um, and so there is a little bit of a lag in there uh, that you're worried about. Um, AI does not understand human context, although it gets better every day. And I'm going to show an example here in a minute that I actually thought might not come back the way I expected, but it did anyways. Uh, but what that really means is that it, it just doesn't understand the nuances of sarcasm or humor or um, uh, you know, uh, anxiety and different things that we might be trying to either communicate or alleviate in a message uh, because it, all it can do is rely on information that it's seen put out on the internet or responses to prompts that it's generated in the past. Uh, and so, again, that's why I'm not worried about AI you know, taking us over in the next 25 years. Um, but it is definitely becoming more and more sophisticated with every prompt and question that goes out there. Um, so, and, yes. Can I interrupt? Because that there's a question that's mm. come through and I think it would be helpful. Yeah. Can you further define pub, what a public AI tool? Um, and what I mean by that is, is a public AI tool public only if it's free? Is it public if you pay for it? Where is the delineation? Yeah, so um, so it is, um, and public AI might not be the, the best description for it, although that's what you're going to see when you read articles and things like that. Uh, even like if Jasper AI is, you pay for it, but it's still considered public AI because anyone who pays for it has access to it, can upload information, and it's using that same repository of information. So it's not like I have a segment in Jasper AI just for Joel's information that I provided to Jasper. Once I give it to Jasper, everybody has access to the information that I have provided out there. Um, and so really, um, anytime you're doing those kinds of things, almost all tools, unless they, like when we get to like talking about the intelligent segmentation stuff, if, if you have purchased a product that is using your big data to do its analysis, if you can put information into that and that's okay because that's not being shared with everybody else out there. But the minute you get into something that's just really tapping into the wealth of every bit of information that it can get, you should consider that to be public AI, even if you're paying a monthly subscription for it, and know that once it's out there, it's out there and you can't get it back. Um, so coming back to context, uh, AI might not understand your customer context either. So you've seen me ask uh, AI to come back with information about meeting planners a couple of times. Um, it probably has a general sense of who meeting planners are, uh, but it may not really understand the difference between certified meeting planners or people that meeting plan for their full-time job as opposed to someone that is a uh, human resources person or an admin assistant that got stuck planning an event and uh, needs to uh, you know, just kind of get through it so that their boss is happy and they can go back to doing the rest of their regular job which means that communicating with that person, AI doesn't know the difference between being using uh, lingo, uh, industry lingo with the professional meeting planner and dumbing it down for the admin assistant that's never heard some of these terms before, right? So, so these things are important as well to know, depending on how you're putting things together, it, it's hard for AI to say, oh, we'll do this for someone that doesn't know much about the industry. It just doesn't come back quite the same way. Um, and then one of the most important things to remember about AI is that everyone's asking the same questions. Like I I've given you prompts and, and there may be eight of you that go back and ask that question now and get your own take on it. And all of that's now gonna live out there in the world. And so if that's the case, 
then you end up with same question, same answer. So what I did is, and I know this is a little hard to read, and again, I'm gonna send it to you so you can see it, but I did that Facebook post about uh, meeting in the Washington DC area. Then I asked one of our staff members, Renee, to, to go to ChatGPT and ask the exact same question that I did so I could see how similar. And while they are not word for word, they are really close so close that a college professor might accuse one of us of plagiarism because of the way that sentences and grammar and things are constructed in these two responses. And if you can imagine that 30 of us have done that, and then 300 of us has done that, and then 3,000 of us have done that, well, all of a sudden, like, there's going to be a lot of people going, I just read that on this venue site, I just read that on that venue site, I just read that on this venue site, and wondering, you know, is any of it mean anything? And that's why it's so important that you spend time customizing it, uh, tweaking it, making it relevant to your specific purpose, your venue, your outreach, whatever it is that you're doing. So it doesn't look like just another carbon copy of what someone else has done 300, 3,000 times over. Okay. Um, here was one. Oh, uh, then we got the last one. Uh, let me stop there. Any questions before I jump into the last little section on ethical concerns? I know we're getting close on time here. No. Okay. Ethical concerns. Um, so one of the things that can happen, as we've talked about, is it perpetuates inaccurate information. If junk goes into the internet, junk comes out of the internet. And so you really have to make sure that you're not just taking stuff and throwing it out there and contributing to the problem. If something looks wrong, or if you just, I mean, really, when you get things back, you should kind of fact check it just a little bit. You don't need to go crazy with it, but do a quick Google, Google search and say, does this actually line up with what I was expecting to see out here? Um, lot, I mean, it is, it's grabbing stuff from the internet. In theory, it's not taking things that are truly licensed as copyright or intellectual property material. That doesn't mean that that stuff's not in there because people didn't upload it themselves as part of a prompt or a query. And so there are definite concerns about whether this huge AI uh, movement is going to completely break down and, and change copyright and intellectual property for the people that are truly creating content and putting it out there. I mean, I, when I do a Google search, half the time I see these things pop up and I go, yeah, AI did that. So, you know, it's taken it from somewhere else, somewhere else. But it's definitely an ethical concern that a lot of people have about, well, what if I do write something? And then it gets ripped and it starts getting you know, uh, propagated all over the internet. Uh, definitely something that, uh, that the law is going to have to deal with in the coming years. Uh, we've talked a lot about exposing private confidential information to a public domain. We definitely want to avoid that. And one of the kind of the biggest is representing AI-driven content as human output. Um, so colleges and universities are definitely struggling with this right now. Uh, the rise of AI is, is, is breaking all the tools that they had to, to find, you know, find plagiarism and, and keep it from happening. Um, but also just on your own basis, like again, if you write that website and most of it is AI, you should probably reference somewhere that this material was put together by AI just from the standpoint of not people not wanting to, you, know, you not wanting to convince people or, or lead people to the fact that you did that. Uh, or that your venue did that or whatever it is. And so again, uh, I think that it's important when people indicate where you've used AI to drive the content or literally just put content in a particular arena. So here's, uh, again, I know you can't read all of this. Here's using AI to improve. So the flip side of it is instead of saying, write me a message to do this, you can write the message and then ask AI to improve it. So here was a message that I wrote about follow-up for one of my clients uh, that I met, one of the prospective clients I met at NACUS. So I went ahead and did that. And then I went ahead and said, will you please improve this AI? And it came back and it's definitely shorter, cleaner, fixed a couple of my grammar mistakes, probably a little bit more targeted than I was in the original outreach. And uh, I could have used that to do it and felt better about the fact that that was still very much Joel it was just AI making it better so I could send it out out there. So if you are one of those people that worries about either the ethical side of it or simply the accuracy side of just asking AI to write stuff for you, write it yourself or, or bullet point it and write it yourself and then ask AI to flesh it out or improve it or make it better for you, okay? Uh, one of the other ones that I did, because I thought it would be interesting, Write an apology email to a meeting planner for mixing up the banquet menu for their event and serving chicken instead of fish. 
And this is one where I thought human context wasn't going to be as good as I thought it would be. And I got to admit, I was pretty, pretty floored. Uh, I hope this email finds you well. Another one that AI likes to use. But I'm writing to extend my sincerest apologies, come to my attention that we messed up, fully understand the importance of doing this. I take full responsibility for the error. Rest assured we're taking immediate steps to address the situation internally to, to prevent this. We're committed to rectifying the mistake. Please accept my heartfelt apologies once again. If there's anything I can do to assist you or make up for it, let me know. Thanks for your understanding patience. Look forward to the opportunity to restore your confidence in our services. It's a pretty darn good email. Uh, so again, it's getting better every day. And there's a lot of different ways that again, if you're like, I just don't even know where to start with this email, throw it in the chat GPT, see what comes up and it spits out, and then you can go from there. Okay, so here's a quick summary for you. AI is already an adopted sales tool by sales and marketing professionals in all industries. So uh, if you are not using it, it's probably time to start, you know, slowly figuring out where are the ways that you can use it best and, and it fit with your style most appropriately. Uh, because if you do, it will save you time and drive efficiencies in your processes that free you up to concentrate on planning and selling. So if you can spend less time writing that email and going over it eight times, or you can spend less time doing all that Google research to come up with information, you can turn that around into proactive outreach and planning for finding more customers, getting them in your pipeline and moving them to conversion. Need to remember that AI is not perfect. So you always want to trust, but verify what it is that you're seeing and going in. Um, and ultimately what you need to do is leverage the right AI tools to support your specific needs. So um, that's pretty much everything I had in my presentation today. I know we're right at time, but if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to shoot them out there and uh, I'll take a couple minutes here to answer them. Thanks a lot, Joel. This was really great content. I learned a lot and I've been playing with AI tools on the side as we've been exploring this. Um, I had one thing I wanted to say is I know that there are companies that rely on the human element to train AI. I know CAPTCHA is one of those things. Um, so I think that's just one thing on the ethical point of it too, is just be wary. If you're uncomfortable with that, like I know that with Reddit's IPO, there was interest in chat learning bots, you know, reading all of the content and then mimicking the behavior of the users. So that's just one thing. And then I asked, I asked the audience just out of curiosity, would you be offended if you received a personalized email that you later found out was written by AI? And so far one person has said no, and I don't have any agenda with this question. I'm just curious if people feel like when AI writes that message, it does take out the personal element or not. So but yes, you're right. We are at time. It's 3 p.m. Eastern. So if you all need to run, feel free to do so. I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes. Joel, I don't know if you are as well. Uh, absolutely, um, I am. But we're, we'll be tightening, or not tightening this up, but sending a, a review of this to everyone who was able to attend and those who were unable to attend um, to be able to participate. And so it was you. recorded. So if you want to rewatch it, or if you have anyone else on your team that you want to share it with, we'll uh, get you the link in that email with the slides so you can be able to do that. Um, and again, we're happy to chat about it anytime we uh, we interact with you or if we see you at a, a trade show or a conference or, uh, or whatever it is. It's one of those evolving things that's here to stay. Uh, it's definitely going to challenge us as a society over time to deal with the, the far reaching implications of it. Um, but there are, there are huge benefits to be gained. And so don't necessarily be afraid of it. Just be cautious as you get into it and be smart about the way that you use it um, and just take baby steps in, in seeing how it works for you. And over time, you can grow uh, your reliance on it as a time-saving tool uh, for the things that you have to do for your work. All right. And uh, seeing no other questions, then we will go ahead and uh, bid you a great rest of your day. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar for Unique Venues or, again, at uh, any of the upcoming uh, events that uh, you may be at, including Sales Plan Bootcamp in Chicago in October or UVMC in San Diego in November. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.